Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant. And today I want to talk to you about two things, actually. The Panasonic Leica DG Vario Sumalux 10 to 25 millimeter f1.7 and the Panasonic G9 to which it has been attached for the last few weeks, Claudia unwilling to let it go for an instant. But before I do, a few quick announcements. First off, on October 5th from 2 to 4 p.m., we'll be leading our next photo walk in New York City. It's free. We couldn't care less what kind of camera you have or what stage you are in your photographic journey because we will have a blast together no matter what. This time, we'll be covering the Lower East Side, Little Italy, and Chinatown. We had a waiting list last year, 12 deep, so if you're interested, hightail it over to Scott Kelby's WorldwidePhotoWalk.com and sign up. Scott, thanks, man, to you and the team for organizing such a lovely event. Next, I'll be speaking at Fuji Love Live, also in New York City, the weekend of October 12th. This is definitely a Fuji camera lover's event, but hey, Fujifilm makes wonderful cameras and glass. I'm a huge fan myself, and my friend Tomas has put together a stellar group of presenters at a fabulous venue. Check it out at fujilove.com, and this is the full URL. I'll also put that as a link down in the show notes below. Finally, the main event for us. We'll be running our next street photography workshop, Streets of New York 2, beginning October 20th, sponsored by our friends at Hasselblad and B&H. Thank you guys. It's three jam-packed days of classroom instruction, street shooting, review sessions, and wonderful camaraderie in the greatest city on earth for street photography. Maybe you can tell I'm a little bit excited. Now, last time we sold out, and Photo Plus Expo is happening the latter part of that week, so if you're interested, you may want to grab one of the few remaining spots and book your accommodations now before prices get crazy. Head over to 3bmep.com streets2 to learn more. We are stoked. Okay, back to the 10 to 25 millimeter f1.7. Now, this is not complicated. This will not take long. The Leica DG Vario Sumalux 10 to 25 f1.7 is brilliant. Relatively big and expensive, though not unduly heavy at 690 grams and $1,800 a pop, and worth it. It's a bargain, even. Let's get into it. With a full-frame equivalent field of view of 20 to 50 millimeters, to my eye, it comes closer to our 2018 lens of the year, the Leica DG Vario Elmerit 50 to 200 2.8 to 4, in terms of sharpness, correction, color, and build quality than any other lens in their lineup. It is a well-built, weather-sealed optic clearly designed for video as well as stills. It has little apparent focus breathing. It looks par focal to me. And the aperture is stepless. You can pull back a collar to reveal an actual depth of field scale on the barrel. Yay. Printed rather than engraved, but I can live with it. With what I'll call soft hard stops. At minimum or maximum focusing distance, something is coming to a stop. I'm guessing the actual lens groups. Though the ring itself, like any other fly-by-wire focusing ring, will continue past it endlessly. Claudia put the 10 to 25 on a G9 and has not taken it off since. I am gobsmacked by the results. I don't need MTF charts. I know what my eyes are telling me. As for the G9, I'll put links to my previous vids on it in the show notes down below. But the takeaway is that the G9 is perhaps the most underrated camera on the market. Relatively small and light, its IBIS handling and ergos are spectacular. 
EVF and image quality is superb. We actually have a 40 by 40 print made with it on our wall, and it has the same sensor and processor as the one in our GH5, which has been our workhorse for video now for the last two years. The G9 offers up to 4K 60B video at 8-bit 420 recorded internally, built-in pixel shifting with the final image rendered in camera. Autofocus for stills is outstanding. Autofocus for video, better than you might imagine. Excellent weather sealing. The handling and weight distribution with the 10 to 25 mounted to it, easy. In fact, Claudia has not complained once about the weight. Nits, eh, one. The barrel diameter quickly exceeds the distance to the bottom plate, making it impossible to properly position it on a long, quick-release plate without a spacer. That's it. In fact, when coupled with the Leica 50-200 and the G9, the 10-25 to makes a compelling case for micro four-thirds over full frame for 99% of us, 99% of the time. And you're done. Really, that camera and just these two lenses Maybe add the Olympus 75 1.8 if you do a lot of portrait work. Maybe you go a little bit wider if you do a lot of real estate work in small properties. No current full-frame mirrorless body offers the combination of IBIS, dual card slots, internal video recording options, pixel shifting, and flippy screens that the G9 does. None offer ergonomics as good. The Leica 1025 and 50 200 are a killer combo offering incredible crispy image quality at full-frame equivalent fields of view from 20 millimeters to 400. Taken together, it's a one-camera, two-lens package with which you can traipse through any major city, never breaking a sweat. Document pretty much anything with wonderful colors to boot. have to see it in the glass and metal to appreciate it. It fits perfectly into a 10 by Cooper Slim 13 with plenty of room left over for phones, spare batteries, SD cards, and ND filters with step-up rings. I know. The only full-frame mirrorless system that can even offer that range in native mount right now is Sony, but it's 1.7 times the price and weight requiring at least three lenses to match it. The 12 to 24 f4, 24 to 105 f4, and 100 to 400 4.5 to 5.6 G Master mounted to, say, an a7 III. That Sony glass is superb. The a7 III does have one of the best autofocus systems on the planet, and compared to the G9, its high ISO performance is superior. Granted, Panasonic's own S1 gets closer than the other new full-frame mirrorless ILC entrance by leveraging the L-mount alliance. Sigma's 14 to 24 2.8, their own 24 to 105 4, and like is amazing but expensive and heavy 90 to 280 2.8 to 4. And that combination closes in on three times the price and two and a half times the weight of the G9 two lens combo. Still, the S1 and its high res brother, the S1R, offer brilliant ergonomics, stellar image quality and functionality, incredible build quality, and the best EVF in the business. Absolutely. Autofocus for stills, brilliant. AF for video, well, hold that thought for another video or two. Canon and Nikon simply don't have the glass in their new native mounts, and neither offers nearly as complete a full-frame mirrorless ILC. Though, Nikon's 51.8 and 24 to 72.8 are superb, and right now the C6 and 51.8 are superbly priced. I mean, you can get a refurbished C6 for 1400 bucks. The 51.8 Zeiss Otis level image quality for 600 bucks. Again, another conversation for another time. Though, to be fair, there are other ways to skin the cat. Within the micro four-thirds world, you could get close to replicating the speed and range of the 10 to 25 1.7, depending on how you define close. If you're willing to forego, say, the full-frame equivalent field of view of a classic 21 millimeter, the trio of Leica's DG line, the Sumalux 12 1.4, 15 1.7, and 25 1.4 is one option. The 15 1.7 is a lens for the ages. We own one. It's optically superb, tiny, and fast. Together, they weigh a little less than the 25 1.7 alone, about 6% lighter, but will cost 30% more. They've got different filter sizes, too. And while I love interchangeable lenses, they simply won't be nearly as fast as a twist of the zoom ring when speed is what you need. You could take the Olympus route by acquiring their 12mm f2, along with the Pro 17 1.2 and 25 1.2, but like the Sumalux Trio, they require both 46 and 62 millimeter step-up rings or filter sets. 
Together, the Olympus Trio weighs just about one-third more, costing almost 50% more than the 10 to 25. Or you could return to the buy now, old standby, Sigma's optically outstanding and aggressively priced 18 to 35 1.8. It'll cost 26% less than the 10 to 25, even with the Metabone Speed Booster Ultra you'll need for it. And it will also give you an effective aperture of, call it 1.4, an effective focal range of 13 to 25. But it will also weigh 42% more, and the autofocus performance won't be as good. Finally, within the Micro Four Thirds world, you could spend much less for the basic Panasonic and Olympus Primes, but the image and build quality of both leave me cold. So, for me... No matter how you slice it, not close at all. Maybe you want to tell me that f1.7 is in fact the full-frame depth of field equivalent of 3.4, that it is definitely not bocalicious. Or maybe you want to whip out the full-frame offers superior high ISO performance argument. Or the G9 only does 12-bit stills, or only has 12 stops of dynamic range. Possibly that APS-C is a better Goldilocks solution than Micro Four Thirds. I understand. There are instances where not only are these things true, but they also matter. Still, allow me to offer an alternative view, because often it's not true, and it won't matter. Let's start with uh, Boca. It's not Boca per se that drives me to fast glass. Instead, I perceive it as a tool to isolate what I think is important in a frame. I'm also driven to fast glass as a tool allowing me to shoot as close to base ISO as possible when I don't have the option for lighting the scene. Base ISO is where you get the least sensor noise, maximum dynamic range, hold that thought, and widest and deepest colors. What I've learned in my own shooting, video and still, is that I typically shoot people, which is where shallow depth of field is usually most important to me, including myself right now in this video, at six feet or less. In this case, the question is not, how much depth of field do you give up moving from full frame to micro four thirds? It's actually, how much light do you gain by moving to micro four thirds? Because at six feet or less, for what we do, I typically won't shoot at less than f2 or 2.8 on micro four thirds. I found this is the aperture range at which I have sufficient depth of field for a normal field of view, call it the full frame equivalent of between 40 and 60 millimeters to have as much of the subject in focus, front to back, as I'd like, while still blurring the background nicely. To achieve that same Goldilocks level of in-focus, out-of-focus on a full-frame camera requires you to stop down two full additional stops, shifting to f4 or 5.6, with a concomitant requirement of lowering the shutter speed to retain the same ISO, infeasible when shooting video, or raising the ISO, which is suboptimal. Thus, in broad daylight, Micro Four Thirds allows me to shoot at higher shutter speeds for my personal photographic work, increasing the odds of a sharper image, all else being equal. It allows me to shoot two stops faster than full frame for our video work, or shoot with a shutter speed four times faster, which is great when you're doing slow-mo. This two-stop advantage of the Micro Four Thirds format for given depth of field essentially makes null and void the entire conversation around high ISO performance because that two stops is precisely the typical low light performance advantage of full frame cameras relative to micro four thirds. Unless, of course, you truly need 1.4 or 1.2 to take in maximum light or for a very specific look. It is also true that the longer your shots are, I'm literally talking distance to subject, the less important micro four thirds depth of field advantage becomes. At minimum focusing distance for, say, Sony's 50mm f1.4, which is a great lens, which, by the way, is 1 foot 6 inches, the difference in depth of field between it set at 1.4 and a G9 with the 10 to 25 set to 25 at 1.7 is just 4 tenths of an inch. That's the difference between having the iris and the eyelashes in focus accruing to the advantage of the micro four-thirds combo. At 6 feet, the difference between the two setups widens a bit. Five and a half inches with both at 1.7, though at that point the full frame won't quite have a person sharp from nose tip to back of head, while the micro four thirds combo will. At 15 feet, you're talking five foot eight inches versus two feet seven inches at the same f1.7. You can argue, and I'd agree, that by this point, finally, the depth of field advantage of micro four thirds in this scenario evaporates. That 1.4 or 1.2 full frame wide open gives you much more interesting opportunities to separate your subject from the background. I'd agree again unless you're photographing a group of people several rows deep. 
The questions become, how often do you shoot at f3.4 or faster on your full-frame camera, 2.3 or faster if you shoot APS-C Super 35? At what distance? In what kind of light? With what subjects? How unhappy would you be if you couldn't shoot any faster? Is it worth the price and weight premiums you pay? When it comes to bit depth, slow down. If we're talking video, the 12-bit limitation of Micro Four Thirds doesn't matter, at least in this comparison, not yet, because none of the current roster of full-frame cameras can record even 10-bit 4K internally the way, say, the GH5 can. We shoot video exclusively at 8-bit 420, less burden on the edit suite, and I'm very happy with the result as displayed on YouTube, but I like shoot at base ISO and generally avoid high contrast, wide dynamic range exterior shots. When it comes to photography, the questions you have to ask yourself around bit depth and dynamic range are, does my subject matter require more than 12 bits or say 12 stops of dynamic range? And will the media through which I distribute my images be able to show the difference if I do? If it's Instagram, YouTube, or prints, it won't. What about APS-C as a better alternative? Possibly. Sometimes, definitely. APS-C cameras and glass are usually smaller and less expensive than full frame. I love Fujifilm's X-T2 and X-T3, the X-H1, for stills. I use a Leica CL for my personal street work, and we have a Sony A6400 when autofocus performance is critical. But Sony really pushes pros, prosumers, and enthusiasts to their full frame glass, which is bigger, heavier, and more expensive than crop sensor glass. Much as I love Fujifilm APS-C glass, they are still typically bigger and heavier than micro four-thirds, if not more expensive. And differences in dynamic range and noise at high ISOs up to 6,400 or even 12,800, I've found to my eye in the real world, are sufficiently negligible to warrant a switch from micro four-thirds. The noise that inevitably results in either case compared to base ISO? Call it character for all but the rarest of circumstances. I could go on like this for hours. You know I can, but instead you get the point. So let's wrap it up this way. The Panasonic Leica DG Vario Sumalux 10 to 25 millimeter f1.7 is the lens we didn't know we were waiting for. It requires less futzing than primes, less gym workouts than Sigma's 18 to 35. It is better considered for manual video focus, and it offers IQ that to my eye matches both. It is a very serious lens for serious image makers. To my astonishment, it is an interesting street photography lens. While dramatically larger and less obtrusive than a classic Leica 50 or 35 on an M, it's like having auto-focusing 21, 24, 28, 35, 40, which Leica doesn't do, and 50 millimeter Sumaluxes on tap simultaneously at well less than one-tenth the price. Though, if you prefer the heritage, feel, unobtrusiveness, and process of the Leica, I understand. Still, taken together with the Leica DG Vario Elmer at 50 to 200 and a G9, Panasonic makes a compelling argument that Micro Four Thirds is a better set of trade offs than any other format for most of us most of the time. I freaking love this lens. I love the results. And yeah, of course, you knew this was coming. It's what I've been using for this entire video. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below. You guys continue to be just incredible, knowledgeable, inspiring, funny. I mean, you're a joy, truly. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Grab one or both of our new Hold That Thought t-shirts you wanted us to put up at our new 3bmepthreadless.com store. Support our work by using our affiliate links down below in the show notes dropping us coffee money via our PayPal link down below in the show notes, or even better than that, we invite you to become a patron of our work over at Patreon. Link down below. We've created our Patreon page because we are stoked to bring you not only gear reviews, but with our What Were You Thinking and Good World Gone Bad series, historical, educational, artistic morsels, and longer form conversations, not interviews, with world-class photographers, curators, gallery owners, keepers of the legacy, folks like Elliot Erwitt, Anya Sear, Mark Lubell, Ethelene Staley, and friends like Brian Smith, Paul Giroux, Nino Rakicevich, and more. 
we'd really like you to join us to deliver this kind of content regularly. Your support on Patreon will really help us ramp it up. In which case, as always, we thank you for it. That's it. For Three Blind Men and an Elephant, I'm Hugh Brownstone. See you next time.